Good day and welcome to iCulture TV. When the subject of we, cannabis, marijuana, Indian hemp, litany of names, but when this subject comes up, he has prick up, maybe justifiably so. In the last few weeks or so, we've heard talk about the Supreme Court striking out a certain bill or part of a certain bill that was supposed to have something to do with the legalization or the criminalization of marijuana, or maybe even the cultivation of same. Now, we've reached out to Parliament to get some deep insight, and who else to do as the honest than the man who is in charge of that bill in Parliament. I'm talking about Eastern Regional Minister and Member of Parliament from Priso, Seth Achampong. We are reaching Seth Achampong from his office in Koforidra. Thank you very much, Sir, uh, Honorable Seth Achampong, for making the time for us. Thank you. It is always a pleasure to speak to you, Kuzi. And as you know, I am happy that you and I are on this conversation today. Indeed, it is welcoming for us to share our thoughts on the journey so far, as well as learn from best practices. I'm sure during the conversation, it would certainly emanate that others are also on the same pathway. And as a result of that, I'm glad and we are having an opportunity to also share ours here. Absolutely, and thank you once again. Uh, uh, Honorable Seth Champo, is it possible to um, get a bit closer to the mouthpiece? We can hear you all right, but it seems as if your, 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 your voice is a bit uh, far out in the background. Is it a bit better now? It's, 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 a, it's better. It's better right now. Thank you very much. All right. So before, before we proceed, can you tell us the, the name of the committee that you chair or you head? in Parliament that is overseeing this bill, before we even find out what the bill is actually about. Oh, thank you very much. The, it, the Ghana's Parliament has several committees. The committee which has oversight responsibility over the security sector is the Committee on Defence and Interior. And I was privileged to be the chairperson for that committee in the seventh parliament of this fourth Republican legislature. And it was during the time that we passed that act. A bit of some information. My current position as a regional minister, I am no more in parliament. I'm out of parliament. Oh, so my apologies. I, 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 I left parliament seventh the 6th of January 2021, and subsequently was nominated by His Excellency the President. And I went through the processes of meeting the appointments committee. I got sworn in by His Excellency, who offered me my instrument of office that led me to come to serve in as a regional term, minister. This, as in this beautiful region, yes, as a regional minister. So my, my sincere apologies. Someone's head is going to roll in research by all means. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what happens is that um, I still discuss this subject because again I was nominated by Ghana to the Commission on Narcotic Drugs which is a subsidiary UN body which is housed in Vienna and as the lead expert of Ghana on these narcotics and psychotropic substance conversation. So that's why I used to find me speak on these subjects. I see. So that actually is probably where the confusion comes from. Because since you were, you know, um, and since you were actually around when the law, you know, actually gave root, most of us think you're still in there, you know, um, and, and doing all of the things that we mentioned. But let's go, let's, let's go on uh, into the actual, actual meat of the matter, if you will. The, the, what's, what's in the bill, really, and what, what necessitated its consideration at all? 
Well, thank you very much. I think uh, it is good to situate this conversation in perspective. Ghana is a signatory to all the UN conventions on illicit drugs, i.e. narcotics and psychotropic substances. So, in 1988, Ghana signed on to the UN Convention on Illicit Drugs. And following from that 1990, 1988 convention, Ghana realized as a member state in the UN community, there was this war on drugs declaration and it was necessary for every member state to domesticate the convention and so it necessitated ghana's promulgation of what you call pndc law 236 which is clearly on narcotic drugs control enforcement and sanctions so it was purely a conversation on war on drugs if you listen to it. If you are talking enforcement, if you are talking controlling, if you are talking sanctions, it should tell you where we were headed to. And this happened in 1990. We've been working with this piece of legislation until 2020 when His Excellency the President of the Republic, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, signed into law the new Narcotics Control Commission Act. And when the law was promulgated at the time in 1990, the enforcement agency was run under a supervisory body called the Narcotics Control Board. So the new law sought to enhance the operations. At the same time, the new law sought to introduce the conversation as a public health concern and over the years it's been evidently clear that it is a social economic conversation as well and so we needed to ensure that the new law encapsulated all these points in the enactment and so that's how this new law is structured the way it looks so we talked of alternative development, we talked of harm reduction because our practice in the past was purely on supply and demand reduction. The four thematic areas of the narcotics control in the global convention looks at supply reduction, demand reduction, harm reduction and alternative development. And all these four themes are within our enactment. So, so if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks as if government on its own volition put this bill in, in play. It wasn't a group of people that were like petitioned or presented a certain, uh, you know, uh, request to parliament to, to look at the, the, the law or the bill or the act, whatever. Okay, thank you very much, Chrissy. You know, I was privileged to be part, a member of the SIF parliament. In the Sith Parliament, the administration at the time was led by His Excellency, the former President, John Dramani Mahama. And this bill came in the form of a bill to Parliament. Parliament worked on it, but they couldn't see the end of the road. And so we could not pass that bill in Parliament. And it stayed in Parliament. It did not get out of Parliament. Now, the unfortunate thing is that when a piece of legislation is brought to Parliament, there are rules that govern its passage. And so all had been exhausted because the life of that Parliament died with that, uh, that uh, proposition. So when the new Parliament or the Southern Parliament came and there was a new administration, there was a proposition. So the proposal that came up was what we carried. And what was the proposal talking about? Primarily, in terms of structure, is what I've described in the thematic areas in the earlier submission. And so that is how come we got here. So mind you, we have started some engagement prior to that. Now, in the lawmaking process, as representatives of the people, once a bill is brought before you, you have to advertise and bring that to the notice 
of the general public. And here the general public are stakeholders. So you have all interested parties, some CSOs, non-governmental organizations, academia, professionals who are practicing. Every person who has some interest in the matter is allowed to submit memoranda so that it will inform Parliament on how to ship the piece of legislation that is brought before it. And so that is, that is the pathway we went to. And so I can authoritatively tell you that we met all shades of opinion. And I must encourage and congratulate the civil society of our country and those beyond, because we enjoyed a lot of their support. They really pushed us, helped enlighten our appreciation of the subject, and gave us some best practices, which is going out elsewhere, and all put together gave us the energy to get to where we are today. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable. And so it's my understanding that at some point, um, the com a, a certain compromise was made between um, recreational use, medicinal use, uh, hemp for industrial purposes, all that. Nah. There was a compromise there, do you know? No compromise there. What was it? Uh, in the law, as we worked on it, and when the law is brought to Parliament, Parliament, by tradition, will have to scrutinize the bill, and members are allowed, based on memoranda. And so, in the first reading of the bill, we were just read, and right honorable speaker, took the bill and referred the bill to the subject matter committee. So the subject matter committee also by virtue of procedure advertised the subject matter and then we asked for memoranda from the general public who are stakeholders and as you may know as many had, that had interest came over. So as the memoranda came and we completed that we went into a committee conclave, sat over the entire report, debated and discussed it among ourselves as a committee, and submitted the report to the plenary, which then gave us the second reading. And it was at this second reading that the policies of the bill is debated. And so at that era, we only go through how we shape the policy of the bill. Then we moved from the second reading into the consideration stage. And that is where amendments that had been suggested are all brought to the floor. And we go through the lawmaking process from scratch to its finality. And so this is the procedure and the processes by which so, we went I through. So what you meant by your position of compromise. We cannot compromise on anything when we are enacting a law because by our procedures and processes, we are not allowed to draw a compromise on a particular matter. Through the memorandums that were, memoranda which were submitted and during the consideration stage, because we are not a rubber stamp parliament, members are allowed to suggest the amendments. So some amendments were sponsored by colleagues of the seventh parliament. And when we get to that era, we have what we call winnowing, where you have a lot of amendments on one particular clause. You all need to go into conclave, sit and listen to every person's argument. And these are normally directed by the umpire, the chair who happens to be the speaker when he realizes that one clause has about 15 amendments. All right. Okay, and so, and so, so let, maybe, let me rephrase that. Uh, maybe compromise is the wrong word to use, but what I'm actually trying to get at is that the, a, a certain group of people presented what now my understanding is uh, probably amendments, you know, to what was already being considered. And they probably wanted the decriminalization or the legalization of, med of uh, recreational marijuana and also marijuana for sacrament as some 
may put it for people who uh, propose to use it for religious uses and stuff like that. It's my understanding that at some point, uh, this group were told, okay, we are going to work on uh, industrial hemp, um, hemp cannabis. And then the other one was not really too much of a go area. Is that what the case was? No. First and foremost, no law in our country legalized marijuana. No law in our country decriminalized marijuana. We attempted to make the conversation a public health conversation as an objective. So part of the objective of the new law is to ensure that we make this a public health concern because we realize that some people just before pray to that. Aside that, best practice is showing us that science is so much advanced in the usage of some of the active ingredients in the cannabis. And as I'm sure by now you know that cannabinoid is used to for palliative care, for pain relief, to help patients in hospitals. Besides so that the trunk besides that the trunk or the stem of the plant has a lot of fiber and so fiber can be derived out of it and that is for industrial purposes. So our law at section forty three at the time stated that we were clear in our policy pathway, the line was to do a regulated cannabis market, not to legalize or to allow for recreational cannabis, which strictly at the time was focused on a regulated cannabis market. And so we were clear with international standards that talked about a 0.3% of dry weight basis. Those were the as exact words we put in the enactment. And Honorable Achampo, that presents several questions to me. Number one is that um, hemp fiber and cannabis for recreational use, to my understanding, are two different things. I personally don't even get why, um, you know, cannabis for recreational use is put in the same category as hemp for uh, industrial use because like you said there's 0.3 um, on dry weight basis again my question there is that dry weight of what the leaves or the, the hemp fiber itself because it's different it's not different the clarity is here we do not permit in our land cannabis which is over and above the zero point three percent in dry weight basis. When the is a narcotic plant, it's a psychotropic is a is a narcotic plant. And so that plant when you harvest it and it is gone through the processes of drying, mm -hmm. the basis for the weight should not go beyond zero point three grams. Zero point three, okay. That's what I we're talking that. about. But my thing, my thing also is that, that if now, you, now I would, if, if you may permit me, a reason why we're saying so is that we, by policy, were been running prohibition, and that was the war on drugs. So there is nothing encouraging recreational cannabis, politically and by policy wise. We are not encouraging recreational cannabis because it is not a subject that the system would want to encourage. When I talk here about the system, all of us put together as stakeholders, nobody sought to do that. Nobody wanted that. And government who was leading also didn't want that as well. Mm. I, guess, I guess that's what I was saying earlier, that government's position was that they were you know a little open to the cultivation if you know and, and production maybe of uh hemp for industrial purposes but not for cannabis for recreational use i guess that's that's what i meant when i started that whole talk about compromise exactly so 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 the policy why would today the supreme court of ghana is calling the section 43 unconstitutional the memorandum that accompanied the bill into the Parliament of the Republic did not clearly state crystal that 
the policy was to direct for the regulation of cannabis. Nowhere in the memoranda did the policy say it was going to regulate cannabis. And so because that did not find space in the memoranda, the law lords outlawed it. However, I believe that the government is determined to move on and find ways and means of ensuring that we are all respecting the Bill of Rights, the constitution of the land, and at the same time being pragmatic enough to ensure that as the global village takes a certain direction, we are not left behind. And so we are very focused on what we have set for ourselves as an assignment, and we will want to achieve that. But for the purposes of this conversation, any person will be listening to me, Yes, government is determined to regulate the cannabis market, but not to legalize the cannabis market. And so we were clear in the enactment that the provision was strictly for medicinal and industrial purposes, not for recreation. So, so I, I was about to ask, how do you regulate something that is not even uh, allowed in the first place, right? But then... Um, my so brother is to say maybe part of the regulation is actually preventing it. Simply, simple. Is no, so, so we were going to regulate it because the section 43 of the current act offers the person that the commission in consultation, the minister in consultation with the commission will offer a license to any person who wants to go into the cultivation. That is what I call as a thematic area on alternative development because evidence abounds that those who are in the illicit trade are doing so some for economic reasons, so social economic factors. That is why we realize that as an alternative development from people who would want to go for Cannabis that is of a higher THC content, which is a prohibited substance and a controlled substance. You cannot allow for the cultivation of those cannabis because the World Health Organization experts who have control over controlled substances and whose expert advice is sought globally by the United Nations, and whose direction the Commission on Narcotic Drugs follow courts as experts did not and have not allowed that substance out of control. The substance is in control, but it has been subjected to scientific measures Hence, the international standard threshold of 0 0.3. I do understand you. My, my challenge there, though, is that uh, we signed on to a convention which was authored by countries which have now, you know, eased up the, 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 the system and are actually making positive gains from doing so. Are we looking at best practices? I, I heard you say that earlier. But are we really looking at that or are we just uh, fixated on trying to prevent um, the legalization or the criminalization of, of, of marijuana? So there are, two, there are two phases, if I understand you well. Decriminalization is where, in the act, a person who possesses cannabis for personal use and not a courier, mm -hmm. when the person is arrested by the law because we still have the prohibitionist measures still enshrined in this law. The law gives some reliefs and here some custodial sentencing has been outlawed. So in that measure you can talk about decriminalization. It rather puts a fine 
on the person who is so arrested on that offense. There are several offenses. The there are the, several. The new amendment. No, wait. There are several offenses. In 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 this is so in the schedule which is accompanying the act. So there's some level of decriminalization of persons who possess for use. However, persons who are traffickers, couriers, are those that the law is fighting. So they are the ones we are controlling. And they go through proper incarceration. For personal use, because the thinkers and the proponents came by the understanding of making this conversation a public health issue. That is why we are encouraged by outlawing some custodial sentences. So people's rights can be respected and then we really know that indeed it is not all who possess and use are criminals. So we have to decriminalize and reduce the penalties over them. Yes. Some custodial sentences being abolished. However, some fines are still there to be introduced. But you still need to put in some deterrent measures. Other than that, there's not everybody who is screwed up like you and I who would go and respect the law. Some would want to take advantage of the system and shortchange the system. The law must deal with such characters. But, but Honorable, why limit it to a public health issue though? I think it's much more than that. I think it's also an economic issue. I think it's a lot more. That's why, that's why I talked about all of that. That's why, that's why I talked about the socio-economic aspect of alternative development. The public health concern is what we are doing with the harm reduction. Okay, but that seems to be the overriding the respect, issue, the, I'm, though. I'm coming again. The respect, of, the respect of people's rights is why we are decriminalizing. So we're doing three things in one law. We are helping to respect people's rights. We are helping to help people on some form of reform. We are helping people to also reform in terms of economic, socioeconomic, alternative development. So we are giving them seedling, if, by the kind grace of God, all go through. As I speak with you, I'll put before you on camera what we call the regulations, which, but for the decision of the Supreme Court, this instrument should have been laid in Parliament as an order, which is going to flesh the act we have built. We have gone through and sat with the Eighth Parliament's subsidiary legislation committee, which went through it fully as a committee to assist the commission in doing what it was expected to do post-2020 after the law had been assented to. And so they, but because we believe in the principle of separation of powers. Once the Supreme Court has spoken, it is incumbent on the executive as well as the legislature to go back to the drawing board and look at where they may not be agreeing and ensure that we amend our ways to allow for the policy change we are driving. You know, we are in a, we are, we are in a general drug policy reform in Ghana. It is, it is a very nuanced discussion, no, no, it is a very, very nuanced discussion. But help us break it down. Are you saying that at this point, uh, marijuana is effectively supposed to be, at least, decriminalized in the new bill that you are working on? Take it phase by phase. I'll get you the exact section and I'll read it out for you to know. Mm -hmm. So it is such that marijuana is not decriminalized. But people who possess marijuana for use, they are people who possess it and they are using it. Those people who use it like that, we are saying the that. The sentence for that is a fine. The that they say, we are saying they are, sent, they are instead of incarcerating them and putting them in prison and hardening them up because we realize that it's a public health matter and it's a human rights matter. And so we are doing all these things and saying that for personal use, possession for personal use, we will not put custodial sentences on you. But for a person who, who, a person who is a gen, who is, a, a person who is trading, yes, 
and selling in large kilograms. You go through the full rigors of the law. I see. Okay. That's clear that for me. That's clear that for me, and I believe for, for our audience too. So let's let's go back to um, uh, an aspect of the question that I think we probably missed. Um, the, the, the question of uh, best practices. Have we looked at some of the more successful stories surrounding um, actively, and I mean actively, uh, you know, regulating marijuana as in freeing up to a certain point and taxing, taxing I'm sorry, it, instead. Here's what I mean, Honorable. Let's say instead of, let's say instead of having um, the police going after people who are underground selling marijuana, let's say we have dispensaries, for instance, where these people can be employed, but it's regulated to such an extent that it's people who really need it that may get it. For instance, these people who uh, may have small amounts for themselves. Where would they get it from, for instance? Have we thought about doing something like that? So that's what, that's what we call in the expert language harm reduction. So, so that's what we call harm reduction. Already the Ghana AIDS Commission under the UN AIDS is doing the syringes and needles program. Uh, we're doing this because some blood-borne diseases are affecting people who abuse substance. And so we say people abuse the substance. Now, I would want to situate this conversation this way for, for a better appreciation. It is still a work in progress. Uh, like I, I told you, we, we had a PNDC law in 1990. Between 1990 and 2020, your guess is as good as mine. A decade, three decades. And then we've been, we've, been, we've been at war on drugs. And it hasn't stopped. We still see people selling large quantities, transiting large quantities. And so the world went back again and realized that, no, we need to change our style because we've been fighting them all along. We're not winning the war. So let's make it a public health conversation. Let's make it a human rights conversation. Let's make it a socio-economic conversation and see the best out of it. Those are the best practices. There are many countries you may hear, you've been hearing from them, the Canada's that you may have, the Israel that you may have. Even in Africa, you have countries like Malawi, you have countries like Uganda, you have countries like Kenya, South Africa, Morocco. It's still an emerging conversation. Nobody's out there who is there yet. Everybody's preparing themselves. Like I told you, if you go to the world body, these are controlled substances. And so until the experts through research and through genuine research come up with suggestions, it is always a challenge to surmount it. The countries that you find them practicing some recreational measures, I mean in Europe you will have just one city, Amsterdam, in the centrum of the Netherlands who's doing it. Portugal tried doing something, but that's also another challenge. When you come to the Americas, I know Colorado is trying, it's been doing it for a while, but they're still having their own issues. New York State, as we speak, is also putting up a fierce reform in doing what we also are calling some legalization of marijuana. It's still work in progress, even in the in New York State. And so your guess is as good as mine. Um, everybody is trying to reform. And so we have a general conversation on drug policy reform. And that's why we are not left out. That's why I talk about best practices. So we're looking at how everybody is doing this. In the last just ended TND, we as a country um, were elected as vice chair to the body. And hopefully if we put up ourselves for the next session's leadership, we are trusting that they would permit and allow us to lead the world body. We are doing so by way of us doing what the conventions are telling each and every member state to do. So we cannot be leaving and not doing the right things. The right things are to ensure that what everybody is saying globally is what we are pursuing. Some but time ago, some, at a point in time, some time ago, this conversation couldn't be held. But today, we've made a lot of progress because people are beginning to see back home here in Ghana, 
we have a major, major debate with faith-based organizations. It's not all faith-based organizations who are here. There's a very conservative state. And you cannot, and you, some professionals, even when we made an enactment, some professionals went to town at us that we really didn't know what we were People to be on the streets, people with psychiatric concerns, started fighting us. But the conversation is not about a psychiatric matter. This is purely an economic matter. That's why it's a social economic. That's why we are asking that alternative development as a measure must be enshrined in the act. That is why we put section 43 there. And so we are very determined, we are very determined to go and make sure that what we want to do as a policy is well thought through and figured out, come by first principles, and ensure that the enactment that we did had no flaws. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's very much understood. But my, my, my next question, Honorable, is um, considering the best practices, if you, you mentioned a few of these places, there's at least one or two of them that I'm very familiar with. I'm familiar with the situation in New York. I'm familiar with the situation in Detroit. Cannabis seems to be reviving the city of Detroit, Honorable uh, Achampo. It's a major economic, you know, uh, opportunity that that brings. Imagine all the, you know, jobless youth who can be employed in either farming or auxiliary, uh, um, you know, uh, professions. Like my, like the example I gave about, you know, people who are underground and are now working in dispensaries. They are paying taxes. They are off, off the streets. They are off the crime list. Stuff like that. So the police can actually focus on real crime. Don't you think that we are moving a bit too slow? Like I told you, you should have our history. That's why I offered a history at the outset in the conversation. Any other person sitting elsewhere would tell us that we are moving so slow. But as a leader and as a policy implementer, and policy formulator. I have to also gauge the temperature of the people I lead. I'm not leading one batch of people. I'm leading a stakeholder. And so at all times, you must be sensitive to the voices that comes around. That's how come we are taking our time to rule out this policy. I know that some wished we were at where you are looking at today but we are not the only ones in this state called ghana beautifully echoed by the detroit experience of the 52 states of the united states i don't think it's every state which is going the way detroit is going no and the fun the, the example the funny thing is it's not even the state of michigan it's just the city of detroit the u.s being a federation the U.S. being a federation, every state has its own rules, every state has its own practices. Yes. And so it is not the entirety of the U.S. as a country which is doing it. Likewise, us. I'll give you the story of Morocco. Morocco has dedicated three regions of a country. And it is only in those regions that they are going to allow cannabis to be grown. There you go. And that is, a, that is the way they are rolling out their drug policy reform program. There you go. We, there you go. we were caught by the foot by the Supreme Court. We are running a democracy. We have to respect the democracy that gave us the opportunity to sit in the People's Forum, the legislature, to reform policy and to create this new pathway for ourselves. It is the same practices and procedures that we must encourage ourselves with. That's why we cite those best practices instances. The city of the state of Colorado is not the only state in the U.S. which is trying to reform and get the best out of cannabis. Several practices are in there. There are a whole school of science which is researching purely on medicinal cannabis and nothing else. They don't look at alternative development as a livelihood purely for pharmaceuticals. They don't even look at fiber. They don't look at industrial purposes. They are only for the cannabis oil, which they can use as a byproduct, which can help boost people's immunity. 
we can help reduce pain in people's illnesses. And that is purely a science base. And that's what others are doing. We are hoping to get there too. That's why we've started the foundation with these laws. And that is where we want to go, no other place. That's great to know. That's very refreshing to know. Let me, let me ask you, Honorable. So when the, when the law finally is assented and everything, um, it will be great news to a whole lot of people who know that they can at least have a little bit for personal use without having to face the danger of going to jail or going to prison or anything like that. How much is a little bit though? Like, what's the, what's the threshold? Indeed, like I said, at the current state, that is where the decriminalization conversation and the rights conversation comes in. The law prohibits the usage. But if you are caught by the law using it personally, hitherto, the level of penalties that would have been meted out to you has been scaled down. Yes. That's why I don't want to say it is fully decriminalized. Yes. But I'm wondering how much would, would classify you as a courier versus as a personal user. No, as, as a courier, let me read out some of the sections for you in the new law so that you get to appreciate sure. it better. Sure. Sure. So if we say, for instance, we're talking about importation or exportation of narcotic drugs. So that is section 36. It says that in accordance with section 126 of the Public Health Act 2012, Act made a person who imports, exports, or re-exports a narcotic drug without a license. Mind you, some for pharmaceuticals import precursors, so some psychotropic substances, used by the minister responsible for health, commits of an offense, and is liable for summary conviction to a fine and a term of imprisonment. These are matters that have been legislated on long before. The person shall serve the term of imprisonment as specified in the fifth column of the second schedule if the fine is not paid. So those are some of the laws. I just want to get unlawful possession or control of narcotic drugs. A person who without lawful authority, proof of which lies in that person, has possession or control of a narcotic drug for use or for trafficking commits an offense. So this is the law. A person who without lawful authority, proof of which lies on that person, has possession or control of narcotic drug for use or for trafficking commit an offense. So you realize it's clearly prohibited. But we are saying in that enactment, you see two things, for use or for trafficking. For trafficking, there are no pardon in custodial sentencing. But for use, there are some pardon in custodial sentencing. That is where we are saying that we are bringing a human face. We are making it a human rights conversation and we are making a public health conversation. Yeah, but my, my question still remains though. How much is it safe to, to be, you know, uh, safe as in not to be mistaken for a courier? Let's say beyond a certain threshold, then I, I, like to, I to I the law courts for a courier. Know, so you know, you know what for a person in a in the Ghanaian local market to call a rule. Yes. A rule. A yes. rule is, is for personal use. That is not a parcel. That is not uh, a, a something that can be. So that is where when you are caught, that they, you know the law enforcement officers certainly would know that you are a user, and then they would not just push you in as they would for any other person. Mm. It, it's still a lot of nuance there, um, but we, we, we have more to do. Surely, severely, there will be nuances. I'm sure we can't exhaust all no, no. in this meeting. We will have to compartmentalize the conversation. We do. And we take it face by face with the law. We do. And then we will attempt to give reasons on why A or B or 1 or 2 is enacted and the style of presentation is why it is so in the act. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I don't think all of this can be fit into one conversation. Absolutely not. 
But let's 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 also examine one more. I, I tell you one thing. Yes. Let me come here. It says yes. section forty one, unlawful possession, or control, of narcotic plants. He says a person who, without lawful authority, proof of which lies on that person, has possession or control of a narcotic plant for use or for traffic offense commit an offense. A person two, a person who commits an offense of unlawful possession or control of a narcotic plant, A, for use, is liable on summary conviction to a fine imposed in accordance with the penalty specified in the second schedule or a term of imprisonment specified in the schedule if the fine is not paid or that was for personal use b for trafficking is liable on summary conviction to the fine and imprisonment you see the first one is a fine imposed in the schedule if the fine this is, is fine for this is fine as a courier, as a trafficker, it is fine and imprisonment. Yes. Yes. Specified in the same second schedule. And an additional term of imprisonment specified in that schedule if the fine is not paid. So you look at the two measures which is being meted out, yes. what I was trying to explain yes. earlier on. Yes. That's, that, that's, that's very clear now. You, you've gone to a lot of pains to, to explain that. Thank you so much. So now I'm also, con I'm also uh, looking at people who may have um, need for it, for medicinal uses. For instance, um, Ghana is a country that's pushing very hard for uh, tourism, for instance. So let's say people are going to Ghana, they want to know if certain amenities are there for them. Some of these may include access to medications that make them feel healthy and alive. And we know that there are people who depend on, you know, cannabinoid, cannabidiol extracts, you know, for pain management and for a whole range of other things. Like you yourself have said earlier in this conversation, what, what's the, apart from, you know, the strangers and all of that, and by the way, Honorable, let me just quickly say this. Um, marijuana, I don't know anybody who uses marijuana with strangers, <laughs> you know, so I don't know why it will come under a program involving strangers, but anyway. Um, my substantive question to you really is, 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 the, is your committee looking at, you know, that department that I just mentioned, the medicinal uses? So you're talking about that. That was going to be given back to by the instrument I talked about earlier. Because the Section 43 has been outlawed, it is Section 43 that policy-wise gave birth for all those interested parties to be welcome in the system. Now, the Supreme Court of the Republic of Ghana says it's unconstitutional because it did not find space in the company memorandum to the bill that came into parliament. And so, and so that is amended and that is, find, that is really defined appropriately in the bill that may go for amendment in the future. We still cannot have anybody come into Ghana on tour to access those facilities because they are prohibited by Ghana's laws. Now let's also look at the human rights question. There are groups that you, and you, I know you've already covered this to be honest with you, but sometimes it helps when we can, you know, recrystallize it for people to actually ingest properly. So right. my question is for, for groups like the Rastafari community who who want to use it for, for you know, sacramental purposes. A role might be more than they require to, to do that. And, you know, once they go beyond that, then that may also put them in trouble. For, even kind of role, for, even for, kind of role is prohibited. Basically, I'm saying, but even that, right, they may be like, oh, at least I'm not going to jail or something like that. But now, beyond that, you're actually going to be considered a courier, and that's not something anybody wants. Exactly. So is, is there any room being made for interest groups like that who are for a very long time been known to use it for sacramental purposes? I think it is, been, it is all part of the rule of law practice in the various jurisdictions where these substances 
are permitted. Unfortunately, in our jurisdiction, we do not permit the usage of those substances. However, I'll give you a very interesting conversation. And the conversation is that before we could agree as a House in the Seventh Parliament over the decision at Section 43, some common knowledge that most of our people did not know. What we call the recipes we eat locally, you know, um, we eat tozapi, which we call tz. The soups, the recipes, the preparation, the plants we use in preparing those soups. And some of those soup uh, ingredients, some come with a higher threshold of, of tetra, tetra hydrocannabinol, the THC wow. content, the active, <laughs> active substance property in the plant. And That's most, interesting. most of it are over and above the threshold that the International Convention is asking us to agree on. And so we recited them as recipes that we're already consuming. But because those plants are not controlled by the World Health Organization and by extension the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, we, we consume them. But cannabis, marijuana, as some others may call it, or hemp, as they may call it, is controlled by the world body. And so it doesn't make it so easy for any person to just go ahead and do what they want to do with it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. We've kept you up quite late. Uh, we do appreciate that a lot. Uh, before we go, let me try if I can uh, rope in this last two questions. First of all, are you aware that um, cannabis is on the stock exchange, some stock exchange markets right now? And also in the US, even though you only a few states have signed on to their own laws, you can actually order um, certain types, certain strains federally. In Texas, where I speak to you right now, we don't have any law that permits you to use uh, recreational cannabis, but you can still order some of it online. You know, it, it may not be THC, THC, it may be a certain strain of the Delta 8, but that's also available. But my question actually is that it's been put on the stock exchange, and that means it's a very hot commer commercial commodity. So it will interest you that I recently bought on the shelves of Ghana some mouthwash, which has a hemp-based property, and it's sold on our, on our market. So they are byproducts. The byproducts have little effect in terms of the THC content, the psychoactive, you know, substance that really may cause some disorders in the human cells that the psychiatric professionals are always fighting as well on. And so those are no worries for us. You go across most countries in Europe today, they have CBD shops and they sell then people buy them. One of the things that got me encouraged, and I always share this story, is that once upon a time I flew from the U.S. to the United Kingdom, and I'd crisscrossed time zones severally, even in the U.S. before coming over and crossing the ocean into the United Kingdom. I realized that I was a bit, you know, exhausted. And on my flight, one of the f magazines I read talked about CBD being an immune booster. So when I got down, I decided to go to the pharmacy shop because they are sold in pharmacy shops in the UK. And when I got there, the attendant told me that he, he realized that I really don't live in the UK. And I said, I don't live in the UK. And they said, because we're asking for a prescription. I said, I don't have any prescription. I'm an international traveler and I've read about it and I want to buy it. And they asked me, which country are you traveling to? I said, I'm traveling to Ghana. They said, that, oh, unfortunately, we cannot sell it to you because your country prohibits the usage of CBD oil in your country because it is controlled by your country's law. That's interesting. So, 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 so you get to appreciate this. There it comes to my mind that I could use it in the UK, but I cannot travel with it. So I'm even stopped from purchasing it off the counter. So it encouraged most of us to see the best practice elsewhere and import some hope. That's why we are on this course and advocating that 
we can also do it as others are doing it elsewhere. And so by, by, for us, it is still work in progress. As we, you may know, during our, back in the day when we were in college, we used to say, Aluta continua. We are not stopping at it. We are going to still push and push and get people to appreciate and see the light we have seen. Nice. Now, my last question, Honorable. Uh, some groups of people, it's my understanding, have also petitioned that they want to get licenses to pro produce hemp, right? And um, the hemp is not necessarily something that you can really smoke. It's just that they grow it for the fiber. And I guess that if you give li licenses to a few people, it should be pretty easy for the government to regulate this, at least on a test basis to see how that goes and see the potential of it bringing in some income. What, what, what's your take on that? Because we are governed by the rule of law, you cannot take any step which is out of the rule of law. The law which will, allow, which will never last get people to run the pilot you are describing to us is what has been pronounced on as unconstitutional. And so we are trying our best. We see the potential in what you're driving at. That is why we enacted Section 43. That's why I said Aluta Continua. The potential is huge. I can say without any fear or otherwise, it is a billion dollar market and we are determined to also assist our nation also get her pound of flesh in this. Thank you so much. The Honorable Seth Kwame Achampo. Seth, you are Kwame, right? Exactly, crazy. That's my favorite name. I nailed that. Seth Kwame Achampo, uh, Eastern Regional Minister, and um, with oversight, com oversight duties for the... Please help me with that title again. I'm so yeah, terrible at titles. Okay. For now, I'm the Eastern Regional Minister with additional uh, responsibility as Ghana's expert to the Narcotics Control Commission. A UN subsidiary. Uh, absolutely. But US and thank you very much for the work you're doing. I uh, interest you to know that Kwesi is my classmate back in secondary school. Yes. Full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for the work you're doing. Honorable. I just pray that as we go forward, um, a lot more you know, people will come to see, you know, a lot of what you are seeing, what we are seeing, but what we are bound by law not to be able to touch. Uh, I think that, for instance, it looks, at, it looks to me from where I sit that um, it may take a, 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 a whole constitutional review to get past some of these roadblocks. But if that's the case, then so be it. And with people like you in charge, we hope that we'll get there one day. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated, my brother, and I thank you for the opportunity to also express my thoughts on this subject. I think the time should go to you and to your hard-working team. All right. Uh, please extend our appreciation to them. I'll do so. I'll do so. I'll do so. And uh, we wish you well, and uh, I wish I culture the best because you guys are breaking barriers. You're breaking bounds. Big ups to you. One we really appreciate that, Honorable Seth Champo. Respect, I Thank you. I. <laughs> Thank you. This has been the Honorable Seth Kwame Champo, and you heard it all for yourself. Like he said, it's not a one-day conversation; it's a nuanced conversation that will keep going on and on. Let's all take the bill. Let's all take this discussion up and bring it to its logical conclusions. Like I said, if it takes an actual constitutional review. To get past this roadblock, I think it's something that we must do. If the question you wanted to hear asked was not asked, it's not the end of the discussion. Send it in and we will forward it to the Honorable Seth Kwame Champong and to all the other experts who make the laws. Thank you so much for watching iCulture TV. My name is Chris C. It's Sean Bako. I come in peace. I come not to please. I'll see you again next week. Have a good time. Goodbye.